makes me look pale. Black shirt makes me look super pale. What up? What's up, everybody? It's hot. It's hot. It's hot in this garage. It's probably going to be shining tonight. And you probably hear, if you can hear me, please let me know if you can. You probably hear some like turbulence, like I'm in a tunnel, because I have to have a fan on me. Because it's like 88 degrees in this garage. But, show must go on. So it's 8.33, we're gonna give probably people maybe 10 minutes. No, that's too long, five minutes to pop on in here. Uh, and then we will start hopefully helping some people out. Have a kind of interesting topic tonight that I wanted to go over, but I hope everyone is doing well. I hope everyone is uh, back to work. Um, working, making money, whatever you can do to provide for your family. Hope everyone's uh, healthy. Uh, let me know where you're watching from. If you are a member inside the Inner Circle, holla at me. Tonight we will be uh, drinking Founders, Pilsner, from... Should have done your research before you started. Should have done your research. No idea. I'm. It's local. It's definitely local. Oh, snap! That's cold. Proof. Yeah, I don't know. It's local. Founders, Richmond, maybe. But it's a good day. Had the day off today, um, and I been working on content all day long. <sighs> I'm working on a complete CB900 car rebuild, tear down, walkthrough. Um, and as well as the next video should be coming out Thursday for these part two. If you haven't seen part one of the rim truing, part two should be out Thursday, is what I'm thinking. Should be. Just got to shoot like one little outro and should be good to go. Um, then just kicked it with my wife all day. It was nice. It's hot. 99 degrees, something like that. 98, 96, 97. I don't know. But um, what's going on, everybody? What we got in here? AICD, you look familiar. What's going on? John Wellman, what's going on from Jacksonville, Florida? Simon, all loud and clear with, with turbulence. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's got to go. It's got to happen. New AC unit coming in hopefully next week. And I shall it hopefully installed in like that following week. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. Um, Pete, what's going on, man? Alec Newton, Kansas City. Whoop, whoop. South Africa. Jersey City, New Jersey. Massachusetts. Already had yingling. On my Coronas. All right. So, 835. So, for those of you who do not know me or the channel, if you're new, welcome. Uh, every month I do a live Q&A where I pick a topic, uh, maybe something that's popular talking about right now, or maybe something that I think will be informal or, or informal, informational. What's the word for that? It will be informal? No, that can't be it. That's like how you dress... It's like laid back, right? Oh my gosh, I feel like an idiot. Hopefully the content is, uh, and I hope it brings a value to whatever you want. Um, as far as topics on carburetors or just random stuff that you may face on your motorcycle, we talk about it here. And after I'm done, use about 30 minutes, I open the floor up to any and all questions, uh, motorcycle related or whatever. And uh, we can talk about them here. Um, we're not political. We don't do none of that stuff. It's all about motorcycles and just the uh, enthusiasm to ride and fix and repair your motorcycle. And hopefully I can shed a little bit of light. I don't know it all, but hopefully I can. Sometimes it's nice to have someone who you can bounce ideas off of. 
I run a membership site where it's an inner circle deal where I have um, tons and tons of content that's not necessarily on YouTube. And we kind of deep dive into people's bikes on there. A uh, bunch of members in there who are super helpful. We have a private community page, kind of like a forum based place. Uh, we have a private Facebook group. We have our own library with tons of videos as well as access to all the carburetor stuff, workshops, whatever. Um, it's an awesome group of people, very smart people, all different types of makes and models and bikes. And they just love helping people out. And every now and then I can hop in there and help out as well. I'm also a factory trained Honda technician. I have been for about 11 years now. I'm red level, fully certified, um, sort of certifiable. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I make content on, uh, hopefully a different style of DIY video where it's not the shade tree version of what you should do, but maybe a, maybe a little more professional way that I can kind of shed light on for you guys for whatever repair you're doing. Been doing this for about three years now, as far as content goes, I do work full time. So I wish I could put out more content, but I can't because I work full time. So while we're going over the topic of repair facilities as you know i am a factory trained technician i work at a honda dealership it's solely honda okay and i think it would be interesting to get a little f feedback or perspective from the opposite side of the dealership you know so because uh, i deal with customers all day long um we are a little bit different shop for sure when it comes to what you're probably used to or what you see or what you may run into um, a lot of dealerships have definitely gone way super modern and it's streamlined and it's, it works and it's a, a money making machine. Um, but I think it'd be interesting to, for you to get the, the perspective from the technician. I'm sure you've had a bad experience. If you have gone to a dealership, I've had bad experiences going to car places. Um, I think everybody will have a bad experience. I mean, it's unfortunately when you work with humans or deal with humans, there will be uh, deceit or lies or um, not feeling as though you have been taken care of or your expectations will not be met. And that's just the way it is um, with whatever you do when it comes to your spouse or the people you work with or where you're going to take your motorcycle or your car or where you get your food. So. The sooner we get over that, the happier we'll be. I'm just kidding. Um, so yeah, um, while I'm talking, you can post comments, post your questions. I used to try to kick this off for an hour, so I'll start this off. We're already 10 minutes in, but I'll start it right now. Okay? And once I feel like I have ran out of breath or have bored you to death, then we'll move on to some questions. I'll try to get down the list. Might make it to the end, might not. I'm going to really try to stick to an hour. Um, if it dries up in 30 minutes, then we'll be out of here. So, again, thank you for hanging out, coming in, checking out what's going on with Motorcycle MD, um, and just being a part of a live stream. Maybe you'll find it interesting, maybe not. So, hope everybody's doing good. I have my common motor koozie. Sweet color scheme. Really cool. Shout out Common Motor. Dealerships. So you guys, I, I think one of the biggest things that I hear about people who are in the DIY community, people who like to fix their own bikes, is for a number of reasons, I would be willing to bet that more than More than 60% of DIY motorcycle repair people do it because they can save money. Um, as you know, whenever you go to the doctor or you go to the dentist or you go to the auto repair guy or your local and friendly motorcycle repair shop, maybe unfriendly, you're expecting to pay a lot of money. Um, I know I do. Every time I go, if I take my car to a dealership, I feel like no matter what, I better go ahead and just budget out 400 bucks, minimum, right? 
So technicians, mechanics have a big stigma um, because there are tons of people who rip people off out there. Um, and it's unfortunate, it gives everyone a bad rap, you know, and it's, it can be a very deceitful system when it comes to repairs. And I get it, I totally get it. A lot of people just will not ever until they die, go to a dealership again because they were ripped off or they were mistreated or they wasted all their money. I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of people have stories. Um, I've been at the dealership for 11 years now. I'm working with people who have been there for about 51 years. So I've heard at all, you know, I've heard all the stories. Luckily I work at a, uh, a full service shop, a full service Honda repair shop with a group of guys that are at a level that I've never seen when it comes to customer care. That's a bug zapper. Go ahead and turn that off. That would be annoying. Now I'm going to get bit by a mosquito. I freaking hate mosquitoes. But I work with people who are cu the customer service and the and the minimum, I guess, or the fundamental idea of how we treat people is something I've never seen before. And I was taught to me by just working there. It doesn't happen at all the places that you go. We, I work at a dealership where you talk directly to the technician. Okay, so if you go to a mom and pop shop, maybe it's not a full brand dealer or a big four dealer or a category five or, you know, where people have like, it's just out, it's like a mall. Um, maybe this is just a place where it says Burt's Powerhouse. You're like, sweet, I'm going to take my bike to Burt's Powerhouse. He said I'll do my carbs for a hundred bucks. There's those guy, kind of guys. And there's guys who work from their home. I can't shed any light on there. I'm sure there's awesome technicians who work from home. Um, and then there's the dealerships where you either go in, talk to the service rider. You never get to talk to the technician. They do all the riding. Service rider or the technician then feeds information back to the service rider about what's wrong. Service rider calls customer. Customer says yay or nay. Service rider responds back to technician. Technicians are just there to just stay in your hole and work. Whereas ours, you come into the, the service department and you're confronted by uh, two old guys and two younger guys um, right, right in your face. And you get to see everything. Um, and it has its pros and cons, mainly being because it. the cool thing is that you get to talk to us. You get to talk to the person working on your bike. The bad thing is that now you're wasting our time. Wasting our time is a strong word, but ultimately people come in, they want to talk, they want to tell you about how they've tried doing this five different times and it didn't work, and we have to write you up, so we have to go out to the bike, do that, bam, bam, bam. It's, it's about a 40-minute spiel from the time that you come in. We give you some idea of what's going on, or you're asking us what's going on, and we give you an estimate, and... We get you all your information. We can go out to the bike, get all the information. So like we probably, I work nine hours a day, but I probably spend maybe five hours working, honestly, between state inspections and uh, people coming in to talk, uh, riding up customers and people calling on the phone to ask questions. Okay. So the way that Honda hits the ground with all of their labor work, when it comes to a dealership, Kawasaki, Suzuki, Yamaha, whatever. It's all going to be the same. Not pricing those, but how they how they do it, which is called flat rate. If you, if you ever heard of flat rate, then uh, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But pretty much what the manufacturers have done is they say, okay, so let's say you need to get into the crankshaft of that CBR1000RR. Okay? In a perfect world where you have all the correct tools right in front of you laid out, the bike's brand new, no miles, never seen the weather, never seen the salt water, never been touched, right out of the box. All the special tools are right there. You've already established what special tool goes to what, and you've probably done the job about four to five different times, maybe even more than that. They say within this amount of time, that job should be able to be completed. Well, 
excuse my language, but it's always bullshit. Okay, it's very, very difficult to beat flat rate. It's very, very difficult. So technicians are now on the, uh, the line between charging what time it takes them. Let's say every shop has their labor rate, okay? $85 an hour. Maybe the electrical diagnostic is $100 an hour. Harley, you're talking about $100 for flat rate or stock time or standard time, and then $140 for electricity diagnosing or you, you know it, it it ranges ours is 85 ours is we are probably one of the cheaper ones along with one other shop in the industry on our little pocket of honda and virginia so just to be totally transparent with you 85 dollars an hour is a lot you're like holy crap i wish i was making 85 dollars an hour it's not the case that technician's probably making a, less than half of that um if you want, if you want to be rich, don't become a technician or a mechanic. I'll tell you that right now. If you want to enjoy your job and you enjoy what it's all about, fixing and repairing motorcycles, meeting awesome people, um, and being able to do stuff like this, then sure, do it. But it's not – you, you got to marry someone with money, <laughs> to be honest. That's what I did. I got really lucky. So the dealership tries to keep that amount. So you come in for a service. You say, I need to get this done. The dealership will then charge you um, a certain amount based off of a number of things. Flat rate time, and then they'll charge you based off of what is reality. Um, let's say you come in with a 1999 Honda Goldwing 1500, and you need the carbs clean because it's been sitting for four years. right? So Honda says that job can be done in probably three and a half hours. It takes, it takes at least a full day's worth of work, nine, ten hours job. Because of everything that you're going through, all the lights that have been put on that bike, everything that's missing, a number of things, screws missing, stripped out. It's been through you know decades of time. So we can't do that. We can't go off of what the flat rate is, which is fair. Same, same with the four-wheelers that you bring into dealerships that you completely swamped and now you want the CV axles changed out. And now we have to clean it off. You know, So there's, there's definitely factors, but they try to stick to that. At least we do. I can say that for, for myself. And I can guarantee you that majority of the time, the technician is likely working for free on a lot of the bikes that he's working on you for, working on for you. So you bring your bike in, you got an electrical problem, and it's um, the bike is dropping cylinders when it's overheating. Okay, and so now the technician says, okay, our labor rate is uh, eighty-five dollars an hour, and you, what we do is we try to say, and w within that hour, give me an hour, you know, just like 85 bucks, just buy one hour and I'll try to figure out as much as I can up until that hour. And if we can't do that in that hour, then we will um, call you and say, this is where we're at. Spend an hour's time. Likelihood, you probably spent two hours, two and a half hours. Probably still didn't figure it out yet, which happens. So you say, you know what? I haven't figured it out yet. It's gonna, it's probably gonna be, you know, we're looking at a couple hundred dollars for me to look at this. You spend all day on, it. eight hours, seven hours, trying to figure this thing out. Obviously, at hour nine, you're not gonna call the customer and say, hey, uh, it's gonna be about fourteen hundred dollars for diagnostic fees. You can't do it. Like, it just good luck. Good luck running a business like that. So you're losing. You're winning and you're losing, right, all the time being a technician for those of you guys who, who are unaware of that. So that's, uh, that's something to keep in mind when going into the dealership. Obviously you may not be talking to a technician, you're talking to a service rider. Okay. Well, how many technicians do you have? That's a, that's a great question to have. They may have one or two. Okay, cool. How long has he been working here? Or, um, yeah. How long has he been working here? Oh, he's new. We got him like four months ago. Well, what happened to the old guy? You know, why is there someone new now? Did that guy get fired? Is this guy off the street? I think those are fair questions to ask. You know, what's his name? What's the, what's the tech's name? Cool. His name's Jimmy. Sweet. How long has Jimmy been working here? Oh, he's been working here for about 25 years. Okay, well, Jimmy's got to know something, right? He didn't make it 25 years knowing nothing and ripping people off. If he's been there for, you know, three or four months, who knows? And you know, some of you guys probably deal with crappy dealerships like or 
mom and pop places that are just they are highway robbery and um they are shotgun approach style style dealerships where they don't know they don't know how to know they don't have the backing from the companies like honda or to say hey i can't figure this crap out i'm gonna call honda and see what they have to say they probably don't know anything either nine times out of ten but that's the cool thing about dealerships is being able to ha have that, that type of backing. But I'm sure you guys will say, you know, there's just no one I trust here. No one I trust. That may be, you know, and that's, that sucks. But going into this, this whole mindset of like the dealerships are there to steal your money. Like this is like these people are working there for the sole purpose of making as much as possible. I think is, is unfair. It's an unfair treatment. Um, and unfortunately to figure that out, money has to be spent, right? If you go into the dealership with an issue and they don't fix the problem but charge you tons of money, then there's an issue, you know? And they should, and they, a good company, a good repair facility, a good dealership should back that if they can't figure it out. I can count maybe once or twice in at least my time and the majority of my boss's time has been there for the longest. Has there been a situation that we that was unsolvable? One happened, I think, just last year. It was literally unsolvable unless thousands of dollars were spent. And the guy had already spent lots of money to try to figure it out. But obviously, we can't charge him all the time because we couldn't figure it out. So it's, it's, it'd be unfair and bad business to do that. So... That's the pro and con of, you know, figuring out if the dealership's good or not, or if the service department's good or not. Um, if you spend the money and the problem solved and you didn't have to do anything, sounds like a good deal to me. Many times I feel like we go to the doctor and you try to figure out what's going on with you. I got this issue. I got that. Two weeks later, you, should, you get a, a call. Hey, it's going to be $1,200 for your eye scan. You're like, what the heck? You know? And... Many people may call back and ask for their money back. Many people be like, crap, now I have to pay this. If you can find a place that you can trust, I, the technician and the customer, when there is trust there and you've built that trust and you've spent money with them and you're not this like, oh, I bought all my parts offline. Can you install them? And you're not one of those people. You'd be surprised at how much those technicians will work for you and uh, help you out in, in a big way. Um, because we're such an old dealerships, you, I can't imagine how many parts that we've had on hand used um, that the customer needed and didn't know they needed. We just put it on. It's, it's probably, it's actually insane how much customers don't know what we fix before they leave. They probably have no idea. Um, I just thought about that, but you know, just simple stuff, you know, like a lever pivot or grease the, the kickstand or, or, you know, um, simple things, move the switches up and they didn't ask for that, but it's done. And they're like, man, my bike runs freaking awesome. I know I lubed the starter button. Isn't that cool? Hopefully you can find a place like that. All right. Um, one thing you can do before you drop the bike off, then this is, this is what to expect when we're talking about what to expect, you know, when I guess you're, you're expecting and i'm gonna wrap this up real quick because it's almost been 23 minutes um i wanted to name it what to expect when you're expecting but it's that's it's already taken i think <laughs> by a movie or something when you go into the dealership check the bike over if you if you don't trust anybody everyone's out to get you everyone wants your bank account numbers your credit card and then want your motorcycle and they want to charge you a bunch of money for it if you're if you're that guy check the bike out maybe it's a problem that you can't solve like you just you literally can't because you refuse to buy a manual, you refuse to buy a, a meter, and you got tools from, uh, I don't know, Harbor Freight that aren't working correctly, and you can't figure the problem out. I'm sure it's been done because people are trying to save money. They don't want to go to the dealership and spend a bunch of money on people who have what they need to get the job done effectively or quickly, hopefully. Check the bike over. Check your tires out. Okay? Just look at them. It takes two seconds. I've definitely called people when they come in for an oil change. I'm like, dude, you know that like your rear tire is completely bald. No, it ain't. Okay. 
not bald. I was lying. Like, you're not going to come back and look at the bike and look and see the tires bald. Don't be that guy, of course. But just check the bike over. You know? Customer service, obviously, is a, is 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 needed on my on technicians end if they are speaking to the customer hopefully the service rider's not a dick and is nice to talk to and is very informal about what's going on and not just like hey uh yeah you uh you uh threw a bearing and you're like wait well how much is that gonna cost they're like oh yeah it's like uh like 3700 bucks like well what happened like and it's just it's just through a bearing, you know. Hopefully you don't run into that. That would suck. Hope you have someone who can explain. Hey, guess what? You came in for an oil change, and you had no oil on your bike. So chances are, and I'll do that. Like if someone bring like brings their bike in, and it has no oil in it, which happens, happens all the freaking time. People do not check the oil. I'm gonna go on a rant. This is about to be rant city. I'm venting. Okay, Will you guys let me vent. I deal with people all day long. <laughs> they got no oil in it because they don't want to check because they just got an oil change 3,000 miles ago. Why would it mean not having enough oil? That doesn't make any sense, right? But little do they know, bikes burn oil. So does everything. So does cars. Okay, they all burn oil, right? It's the amount that we try to keep efficient or they try to keep efficient. And I'll call them and be like, Hey, your bike had no oil in it. Like none. I, I dropped the dip. I dropped the, uh, the drain plug and it filled a thimble. Okay. It filled a little thimble up. So I just dumped it. We're going to put some fresh oil in there. Best of luck. Because if you know, 200 miles, you're like, dude, I lost all compression in my bike. I don't want to be in charge of that. You know, because you touched my bike last and didn't do that before it came in. Now it's smoking. Well, yeah, it's smoking because you blew the rings out. You had no oil to burn. Now it's burning oil because there's blow by past the rings. So, yeah, when I put oil on your bike, now it's going to smoke. When one did that before, okay. So I'm going to I'm gonna rebuild your motor based off of it wasn't doing that before. You know? So what was I saying? I don't even know. That actually hasn't happened, but I could totally see it happening. I could totally, I, I can, I have nightmares about that. You know? Um, oh, yeah. So check the bike over. Check the tires out. Um, check your chain out. If you have a chain, is it flopping McFlopperson? You know, they're probably going to suggest you ch- tighten the chain. Okay? Um When's the last time that you ever did any fluid on your bike or air filter? When's the last time? Okay, you got 47,000 miles on your bike and you've never touched anything. The only thing you brought in there for is state inspections, right? Sure. When you fit, when you failed state inspection last year and you got a new tire put on, that was it, right? That was it. That was, that was all you did. So when they call you and say, hey, when's the last time you've done this? It's likely not because they're just trying to do these bunch of upsell things. It's because the bike looks like it has never been serviced, right? Your kickstand barely goes down. Levers, when we try to, to, to pull into the shop, the throttle's sticking. Okay, the horn barely works because you never use it. Headlight blown out. Okay, there's, there's situations where you can't just be like, oh, this guy's just trying to upsell. That's what they're doing every time. Very unlikely. I think, I think the best interactions I've had with customers are people who come in and say, look, I, I take very good care of my bike. Okay. But if you see anything wrong with my bike, anything at all, please let me know. We're going to take care of it. Like I want to take care of it. I don't want to haggle and they don't say this, but this is what the intention that I get from customers who come in and say that, right? It's whatever it is. Listen, I know my bike very well, whatever it takes. If there's anything wrong, it's out, misadjusted, needs to be serviced, whatever. Just look, let's do it. Knock it out. Okay. That's not if the person has morals. That's not the time when I'm like, oh, here we go. 
bread and butter about to make some money. It's not. It's not. More times out of 10, that guy will probably leave spending like 25, 30 bucks. Come on, dude, everything looked great. Honestly, and maybe 2,000 miles, you need some front brakes, but right now it's fine. You know, then you know, that person is usually like, well, let's just go ahead and do it. And you're like, okay, cool. That works for us both. He's happy. He's got fresh brakes. I get to make a, maybe a little bit of money off of the labor that I'll charge and so on and so forth. Um, don't lie. If you go to the cost, if you, if you bring your bike in, right, you, you just bought the bike, hasn't run in 10 years. You bought the battery five years ago and you've been working on it. You tore it all apart. You sawed the frame off, cut the motor in half. You super glued it back together, put it back in the frame. You ran a piece of yarn from the throttle cable to the carburetor and you brought it in and you're like, look, I don't know what's wrong with it, man. Like, I don't know. I don't know what happened, but it's not running now. And I just need you guys to diagnose it and look at it. And we're like, okay, when's the last time it ran? <sighs> it's been like six months ago or it's been a year ago. I'm like, okay, well, how old is the battery? Oh, the battery is like, it's new. It's new. So I, I just bought it. It shouldn't need a battery. All right, cool. And like, I'm, I'm literally trusting you. That's technician or, or the service rider is trusting what you're saying. But what happens is when I go to look at that bike, that's not the case because we're going to figure out what's going on. And when we figure out what's going on, it's going to be one of two things. You've been lying and there's something that you've done wrong. Your friend did wrong that you paid to do it. Um, or things are way, way off. So then now I spend my time diagnosing the problems, going down the list of what's going on with the bike. And all along, if you would have just said it sat for, or it, you know, it shut off because you ran into the back of a truck and, uh, you lit the bike on fire, but then you put new stuff on it. And now I can't tell if you would have just told me then we, my mindset going into the repair would have been different and how much I charge will be different because I'm not going to spend that much time figuring out what you did wrong. So it's best, if that makes any sense at all, it's best just to be super upfront. Look, I went into the carburetors. I probably jacked some stuff up. Boom. I know exactly where to look. Okay, sweet. So you went to the carburetors, you screwed them up. Big deal. People do it all the time. Right, or you paid your friend uh, two Snickers bar and five bucks to clean your carbs out, and he did a, a hack job. He had no idea what he was doing, but he said he knew what he was doing, and he screwed it all up. Okay, just just let them know that, and I, and I promise it'll be, it it would the outcome will be better because we know where to look, what went wrong, and the fastest way to point A to point B in diagnosing is just knowing the information. That's why when you drop your bike off and you say, hey. It's got this squeal. Okay. Where's the squeal at? Uh, only when it's raining in the front wheel, typically when I'm shifting from third into fourth. As far fetched as that sounds, that is direction. It gives you an idea of what's going on and not just like, hey, why are you guys charging so much? Or my favorite line that I hear is I call someone and say, hey, your bike's been sitting for nine months, okay? The inside and the bottom of the bowl of the carb looks like someone packed it full of salt, okay? We gotta clean this out. I'm gonna go ahead and put new fuel in the system, new spark plug, get the old oil that's also been in there for that long out of there. It's gonna be about 400 bucks. 400 bucks? Well, shit. I mean, I, I, I know how to do it. It, don't, it, it wouldn't take me, you know, $400 worth of work to do it. Or my other favorite is $400. Man, is that the best you can do? Like our answer to that is no, we can always charge more. <laughs> Just don't be that guy, okay? Where you're, where you're trying to haggle w with this person because you don't have the money to afford what you want to do or – it's a lot of money, right? Then that's not the time to be trying to fix your motorcycle. I mean, or go and get a second opinion from someone, you know, because at least that they're going to do, if they say, hey, it's going to be $900 to fix this. And you're like, holy crap, I brought it in there for an oil change. You say, no, I don't want to do that right now. I want the oil change. Tell me what's wrong. Write it down. Boom. Go to, go to someone else. Get their opinion. Okay. The most they're going to do is charge you for a diagnostic fee. You may be out 60, 70 bucks, but hey, 
likely it's going to happen with your car as well. It's not just your motorcycle, you know? So it's just, it's the name of the game, unfortunately. And I get that there are cons out there. I get it, dude. I've, we have, we have shops and I'm not going to name any names, but we get tons of customers from these other shops, tons, you know, from these mom and pop places. Yeah. So-and-so did the carbs on it. We're like, Oh God, this is going to suck, you know, cause they don't know what they're doing. If you, if you would have just spent more money up the first time, like coming to a dealership or, you know, getting us to do, or a, a, someone who knows your bike and knows the company to do the job instead of being like, oh, well, these guys do it for half the price. Maybe I'll get lucky. And then I don't have to spend double what these people are offering. Okay. The dealership's going to charge you $800 to do a set of inline four carbs, which they probably won't even touch now. Most dealerships aren't even doing carbs. It blows my mind. And then you go to a mom and pop place like, yeah, I'll do it for 150 bucks. Well, guess what? Your bike's probably not going to run very well after they're done. There's a high probability that the bike's not going to run very well. Okay? Because they probably clean lawnmower carbs more than they do other places. Not saying that all mom and pop shops are bad. If anybody works in a mom and pop shop and you are banging it out and you do quality work every time and you are consistent and you are a legend among men and you deserve to work at that dealership and you probably love it. Okay? I know there, there are some really good guys who work at, at mom and pop places, and I do not bash that whatsoever. It's probably one of the funner places to work, okay? Because you don't have to deal with warranty work, okay? Warranty work is you do the job. No matter how long it takes you, we're still only going to pay you what we say it takes, okay? So you're, good luck. For instance, Go Wing 1800, right? Rear brake recall. Rear master cylinder. You had to replace it. Honda pay 1.8. Okay, on a gold wing, every single gold wing from 2001 to 2000, I think 16, maybe 17, 2016, had to get this done. We did probably over 350 of these things. Okay, a lot, a lot for three technicians to bust out. We ne- we knocked it out over one winter, went into the summer with it a little bit. Good money. It was good money. 1.8 hours. And if you had a stock gold wing and it was nice and it was clean and, uh, Everything was there, you know, bolts were there, they were where they should be. You could probably have it done in 1.2, maybe 1.3. And you, you beat that flat rate. That's the cool thing about flat rates. When you can do well, you can beat the flat rate. And then all of a sudden, now you have this 0. 0.4, 0. 0.3 left over that you're still getting paid for, but the job is done. If you hustle on to the next one, guess what? Now you're stacking your time. But it's rare. It's very, very rare, especially when it comes to motorcycle work. All right, um, very rare. But Gold Wings, you got the customers who put all those lights on it, right? All the lights, all of them, all hardwired in. They got ring of fires, they got strobes, they got blenders, they got all this stuff all over the bike, okay, that they did, someone else did, who didn't know what they were doing, but they installed it. And it's all hardwired in, no quick disconnect, nothing. Guess what? Honda don't give a crap about that, okay? Because now... You're, the technician's dealing with it. So you expect us to call the customer and say, hey, I know this is free, like this whole like warranty recall thing, you know, and it's not your fault at all. Like it's totally Honda's fault for this. And I know that your rear wheel is locking up, you know, again, not your fault, totally Honda's fault, but I'm going to have to charge you about 180 bucks more, you know, because of just what you've done to your bike. Let me know how that goes for you when you went and, Listen to what that customer says. Because it's not their fault you're going into the bike. If there wasn't a recall, you'd never have to go into the bike for that reason. And Honda's not going to pay extra. And they're not going to pay it. So warranty work is not fun. Yeah. That's a solid 30-minute rant. I think I have like two more things I wanted to say. So when going back onto the topic of... Um, the type of customer that you are bringing your bike to the shop. Okay. I said, look over the bike, check it over for, for yourself. Okay. Um, pay attention to any dents, nicks, paint chips, whatever. Okay. Make sure that, that you know, and you're aware of what's going on with your bike. That's, that's your job. Okay. 
um, because the people who you're dropping the bike off are not perfect, unfortunately, you know, and things can happen. That's just the way it is, right? That's why we hopefully don't serve material items. But when you come in, okay, and you have an issue with your bike, from my perspective, from a technician's perspective, things that you can probably stay away from saying, even though I run a channel that teaches you how to do things online, how, and I give information that hopefully is very beneficial because it's what I would do on a job. Um, that's why I wanted to do this instead of just like beating down forms with random information. It's going to the dealership and saying, hey, I had this problem, but I heard on the internet and like that's like bold on their forehead. I read somewhere on the internet that it's not that and that it's this. And we're like, well, yeah, but that system has nothing to do with it. Yeah, but I, but these people on the internet, they said that, that that part has to do with that. We're like, no, it, it doesn't. It has nothing to do with that. And then they're like, well, that's just not what I heard. you know. So I guess you could do whatever you want to do and look at the bike. Ultimately, what, what you're doing is saying that the information that, you're, that I'm talking to you with, the information that you have, that you've been trained with or have been doing for a majority of your life, is less than what I've read on the internet. I mean, that's just, that's just how I view it. What the knowledge you have is not worth it. So I'm going to tell you what I think is the correct way, but I ultimately have me being the customer. I ultimately have no idea. Um, that's just what I've heard. So the information that you want to provide me right now is not really helpful at all. That can happen if you come off very, very um, matter of fact, I guess. Um, as in like, I'm not going to tell you how to do your job, but you should probably listen to me because I read something on the internet. That can be very frustrating. Also, the number one killer, the number one killer of dealerships, motorcycle repair shops, is you buying parts online. That's just the way it is, okay? Because the fact of the matter is dealerships, companies, they cannot compete with what you're buying your prices for. So the what you buy your tires for off Tire Rack or Amazon or uh, four into one common motor, uh, not necessarily common motor because they are their their prices aren't aren't necessarily the cheapest. But four into you know like these places that you that you buy yourself on offline, right? Then places like dealerships cannot compete with it. It's just nice that they just can't. We're not tire warehouses. So yes, when you call and ask for a price on a tire, expect it to be more than what you're going to buy it for online. Okay, you you, you have to expect it because. That dealership is not pumping out tires as their main source of income. They have tires there because it provides service when needed, right? But we're not making bank off the tires. So, and we can charge this really, really low rate, almost like 5% of what we bought it for um, because we're just rolling. We're just dumping tires out all day long. It just doesn't happen. So yeah, the, the price of the tire can sometimes be like 50% more. That's how we have to compete, you know, with, with, just the idea of having a tire and trying to make some money off of it. The cool thing that we do, knowing that people will always buy tires offline, they're cheaper. Okay, if you buy a tire from the dealership from us, we're gonna take off money from the labor. We're, we're gonna discount that labor um, to say, hey, you know, thank you for supporting the, the local dealership. Because of that, we're gonna help. We're gonna, we're gonna throw you a bone because we know the tires are probably more expensive, but you're choosing to buy them with us and have them installed by us. Okay. So it's really cool when dealerships do that. If we sell bikes, if you buy a bike from us, we give 10% off parts and labor for the entirety of the bike for the, as long as you keep it. It's, really, it's a really cool benefit. Um, but parts, you're going to find them cheaper elsewhere, okay? Um, especially aftermarket stuff. Like, we just, we just can't compete. The Honda prices are very expensive. Yes, a CDI unit that costs $899 is very expensive. And it's not... It sucks. I mean, it's very expensive. and the, But you can find one on eBay, obviously, cheaper. Um, hopefully, it's factory. Or you can find one on uh, like a factory parts warehouse, Babbitt, something like that. And it's like 25% off when really all they're doing is taking the dealer net price and like bumping it up a couple percentages, like 10%, 20%. Can't compete because guess what? That's all they do is pump parts out. That's all they do. So they can drop that price in the part, so it benefits you. But when you know when you show up to the dealership and say, "Hey, I need this, 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 and this done," 
and I already bought all the parts. I bought them all offline. Can you install them for me? It, 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 it won't sit well. It won't sit well because you're not showing the support that, that, and that you could have with the dealership, um, ultimately making them less. So they're like, well, you're not, if you're not going to buy parts from us, then I'm going to jack the labor up. I'm sure that happens because it just, it just puts a bad taste in your mouth. Like, or you buy the wrong part. You bring us all these parts and it's the wrong part. And we're like, well, you bought the wrong part. So now I can't do the job. So now it's going to wait another week until you order the new part when you couldn't just ask me to get the part. And I would have gotten the right one. And guess what? If I would have gotten wrong, you know, I don't have, you don't have to send it back. You're not losing any money. I'd send it back and I'll get you the right thing. <sighs> okay. I'm done. I'm done. Sorry. Oh, yeah, that's cold. So, guys, thank you for listening to that. Let's let's dive into some questions, man. I, I blew people's ears up. They probably did not want to hear what I had to say. Guarantee it. That's okay. I'm sure we lost some people, but um, I'm very passionate about the dealership, customer service, and how they should be treated. And uh, what you pay for is exactly what you're going to get, which is going to be perfect to the best of my ability every time. And that's what our entire shop believes, right? I want you to come in me and like, dude, my bike has never run like this before. Thank you. Worth every penny. That's what I like to hear. And we, and we, we get it a lot. Um, reviews are Reviews are king. Always. Reviews are always king. Just check out the shop's reviews, and then that, that'll tell you a lot. So, that's it. Let's pop in some questions. Sorry for the ranting, guys. I knew this topic, for me, it would be all over the place. I probably should have thought about organization better. All right. What's going on, guys? See if I can find the first question, and we'll dive in. Got 20, 20 minutes left. Uh, Steven Sherman, working on CBX 1000, almost ready to install carbs. Can't wait to get this one running. I bet, dude. I bet. Uh, hopefully, you're not repulling those carbs again. Hopefully, they're perfect. Um. The Motorcycle Muse, looking forward to this video. I actually had a few problems with various car motorcycle mechanics over the years. Not all mechanics are as talented as the Motorcycle MD. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are. Um, watching in Ireland. Awesome. Uh, Mike, Mike says, how much life should you expect from your chain and sprockets? I've heard 15,000 to 20,000 miles, depending on maintenances. Depends on the brand, um, how quality the metal is, um, and maintenance. Uh, I can't you you can't put a timestamp on that. And that's like putting a timestamp on tires for motorcycles. You can't do it, you know, because if you're a hot rod out of the red light every time, because you don't care, you're just like ah oh, green, and then you're gone, and you're like off the throttle, on the throttle, off the throttle, on the throttle, and you're just like yeah, and that change is like jerking this whole time, and you're taking torque, removing torque deselling at a high, you know, high RPM, then gassing it real quick, 4,000 miles maybe. But you can't put a mileage on that, um, unfortunately. Same with tires. How much do you brake? How, how hot do you go into corners? How hot do you come out of corners? You know, it's just, there, there's just way too many variables with that. But um, I think that you should see on a O-ring chain, maintenance properly, normal rider, whatever that means, I would think that you should see over 6,000 miles out of it. So over six to over 8,000 miles minimum. I think that's a safe thing to say. Uh, let's see. Juan, would you know any repair shops for older Honda going 1,076 in or near Shreveport, Louisiana? I have no idea. No idea. Never been to Louisiana. Um, uh, John 
beyond though, can a valve job be done on a 01 VT1100 without pulling the motor? Negative. Negative, Ghost Rider. That motor has to come out. Uh, Steven Sherman uh, picked it up as a basket. Wait, did Steven have another bike? CBX 1000. Okay, this is the CBX 1000. Picked it up at the basket. All I have all the parts now and going too well. Very cool, man. Very cool, Steven. My boss has two of them. Um, BMW motorcycle review. Sup, dude. Came in to pick up the Rebel and it was gone. Glad for the shop, however. Stock, stock is pretty much non existent. Any clue where production might kick back in up in Asia is this long term. So what he's referencing is that, as you'll see at most Honda dealerships or dealerships in general, their showrooms are probably getting pretty slim, pretty empty. Um, all shipping is pretty much halted. Uh, it has been for maybe two months since everyone started to see the effect. So any orders that were going out to get new bikes in has just been halted. It's just, it's not happening. So what we're hoping is to see bikes coming back in at the end of August and early September. Um, that's what we're hoping. But the warehouses are empty. No one can get bikes. A lot of showrooms are empty. We put, we had to put all of our used bikes in the showroom because there's just we don't we don't want it to look so empty, you know. Um, but yeah, that rebel got sold. Uh, glad you're here, uh, Ray Brown. You 100% cannot trust your repair shop. I sent my bike into three motorcycle shops to repair my front brake. I ended up repairing it myself using YouTube videos. You 100% cannot trust motorcycle repair shops, says Ray. No comment. TJ Johnson, I watched your video on airdrop adjustment, air, I don't, uh, probably auto drop adjustment when I went to get the Welch caps. Okay. I watched your video on airdrop adjustment when I went to get the welch caps would not break loose. So I basically just removed the top portion of the cap and left the rest in there. I shouldn't have. You could have. I mean, until you go to remove them, you can leave the material that you busted out, the head off, the material that's left in there. If you can make your adjustment, then that's fine. But when you go to remove that, port or that paper needle no you have to remove it you have to drill it all the way out if you get a big enough drill bit man you should be able to pull all that metal out just keep bumping the drill bit up and it, it will eventually grab onto that metal that you're drilling into and it should pull it right out um nw also says also i can vouch for Honda norfolk worked for a ton of dealers some not so good Honda Norfolk is the only shop locally I would trust as a customer. They are top notch. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, man. Um, Justo says in New Jersey, it's $120 an hour. That's very expensive. That's very expensive. I couldn't imagine that. I couldn't imagine. I couldn't imagine that. I imagine one day we go from like, yeah, we're at 85 an hour right now. Next week, we're going to 120. Dude, that's such a huge jump. Such a huge jump. I thought people were bankrolling. It's crazy. One day. Maybe not. John Wellman discovered my 99 VT1100 C3 mix screws were only open to two and a half turns. Been bogging down. And wide open throttle won't go above 60 miles per hour. Hoping running it at 3.25 turns will help the power curve. It likely will not help the power curve at wide open throttle. Okay. Um, you need to do some fuel pump checks. Make sure that, that that output, that volume output of the fuel pump is doing well. I have a video on that. Um, uh, but the mixture screw will not affect your wide open throttle. You might need to go into after those carbs if the fuel pump's doing okay and see what's going on with the vacuum diaphragms or if anybody's put a jet kit in there that's not suitable. Or uh, 
they got some like dumb aftermarket air filter in there that's just sucking in way too much air and now it, it's breathing too much at wide open. Um, if you have like a K&N filter in there, try going to a stock filter, see what it does. You know, it's worth it's worth the money, I promise. Um, uh, yeah, AICD says, John, you're well, you're beyond pilot circuit at 60 mile an hour. Thank you. Um, Steven uh, says, Cody, have you ever been to East Coast Sturges in Little, Little Orleans, Maryland? You should come this year, August 5th to the 9th. I've never been. Unfortunately, that's the weekend of my wife's birthday. Um, I've, I've never been to Sturges. I've never been to any of the Sturges. I heard, I heard it's fun, dude, but like, I also heard there's tons of traffic. <laughs> Sitting in traffic, all these Harleys overheating, you know? Just sitting there, just boiling over. I don't want to smell it. <laughs> totally kidding. Oh, man. That cold water or something else. All right, let's keep going. Um, John says, slide, clean, diaphragm, solid, sonic, clean, everything. New air filter, just pull straight, just pull straight pipes. Put Harley mufflers on for some back pressure. Well, something's wrong. And, and one of those things you just named, something's wrong, I guarantee it. Or you're dropping spark at 60 mile an hour. Um, but what you didn't label or name is the fuel pump. So keep digging. I have a suspicion that the fuel pump's not putting out what it should. And don't you dare put an Amazon fuel pump on that bike. You'll be right back here again. Um, Todd Johnson, my local shop are crooks, period. They charged me $80 twice to install my own tire, and it didn't hold air. So I returned with my flat, and they charged me another $80 to fix their screw-up. That's, that's no fun. That's no fun. I wouldn't go back there. I wouldn't go back there. That sucks. If I if that happened to me, I would likely go pick the bike up. Likely. If you're close enough, I'll go pick the bike up. It's something that I did wrong. Um, sounds like you have tube type tires. They probably pinched it. Didn't notice it until it left. Um, because it was probably holding air for a good period of time. Or you came and picked it up quickly after they had finished the bike. So... When they finished the bike, put the tire on, and it was not leaking because they thought that it wasn't leaking because they didn't put a huge hole in the tube. This is just a lucky. This is just a guess, not a lucky guess. It's a guess. When you left with the bike. It was a flat tire. You, or you left. It got a flat tire. You came back very frustrated because you just spent eighty dollars, and then you're lying. And then they now have to fix it, and they're going to charge another eighty. That is, that doesn't seem right. Especially because it's if it was a tube issue, they can pull the tube out and verify if you ran over a nail or if they pinched the tube. You you can look right on the tube. You know, is it at a spot where they pinched it, or is it where a nail was stuck in the tire? They shouldn't have done that if it was their fault. I'm sorry, man. One eighty seven moth misfit spade said not checking my oil is why I'm doing the swap. Blew my engine. Zombie. It happens, man. You ride your bike every day. Sometimes it just gets away from you, I suppose. Or if you're like heavy on the throttle. I I, I see bikes that people who are obviously just running the crap out of that bike, you know, just always, always going full throttle. Those are the ones that don't that lose a lot of oil. Those those are the ones. Um, Cardigan says it's a Harley. I constantly check my oil. <laughs> I love it. That's awesome, dude. Honda's burned too, man. Honda's lose just Honda's Honda's lose oil, dude. Honda's lose, I've seen, I've seen almost half court to more than a half court. 
in less than 4,000. I mean, uh, it, it, and there's so many different factors. Um, but it's normal. Uh, I, if you guys haven't heard me say it before, I think the standard for oil loss in the industry for motorcycles is a quart, I think every thousand miles, which is a lot. And, I, and um, someone can check me on that. Um, it may not be a thousand, maybe more, and maybe like 2,000 or something like that. I want to say it was a thousand, but it's one, it's, it's a very low number. Okay. And obviously the dealer, the industry, the manufacturers hit the mark way above that, you know, they don't want that to be their slogan. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, the most I'm use this is absolute quality. Haha. <laughs> Could be heading for the motorcycle and these best video. Dude, thank you. This was a tough subject because I think I'm stepping on a bunch of people's toes. Um, but I try to cover myself. I know there's bad shops out there. I know it. I, I, mean, I can't, I, yeah. It's unfortunate. People shouldn't be grabbing text off the street. Okay, ask them if they got text from MMI. I'm from MMI. If that technician came from MMI and he's passionate about his job, I guarantee you he's gonna do 80% of the work on your bike correctly. It's a lot. That, that That's a big number, you know? But th those guys have been trained and it's something that you can trust. If, if they picked up, you know, David from some, like, construction company and he can't do nothing, then why hire him, you know? <laughs> no pun intended. He's probably listening to this podcast. I mean, not a podcast. This video. Oh, well, I'll hear about it later. <clears throat> Let's see. How do I remove melted plastic bag from exhaust? Try a very, very sharp razor blade at a very low angle. <laughs> You'd be surprised. Don't, you know, here's here's your exhaust. Don't take your razor blade and do this. And don't go at such a sharp angle with that sharp part hitting. Kind of go real flat and just really spend just tiny bits at a time with a razor blade. Even boot. You know, you melt your boot on your exhaust. One time I rode from, I rode 35 minutes. And if I named where it was, you probably wouldn't know. It doesn't matter. With my wife on the back. And on the Nighthawks, if you're familiar, they have these like awesome little guards for the exhaust. So you can actually take your foot peg. It's like, it's the most comfortable thing to me. You take your foot peg, your feet off of the pegs and kind of just shift them back onto the exhaust. There's like these metal brackets that are there, supposed to be there. People would like to cut them off for whatever reason, but you can move your feet back and it's just, it's so much more comfortable. Yes, your feet are off the pegs, away from the brake and gear lever, but when you're riding, you're cruising, who cares? You know, you're just laying back, relaxing. My wife was on the back, and she thought her foot was on the rear passenger peg, and it wasn't. She rode like 45 minutes with her boot on my slot. <laughs> it was roasted. I was like, I, I had like a heel on my exhaust. Razor blade came off. Ah. Oh. Good time. Uh, yeah, John, brake parts cleaner, WD-40 with a razor blade at a flat angle. Boom, dude, see? John's a freaking man. I just didn't say any chemicals. You can, you can try, a, yeah, you can try any chemical you want, you know? Uh, this is such class. I don't know what that means. AICD said, you, you have to tell your doctor everything, just not 40 minutes worth. <laughs> Shane Subaru, I tell my customers, the, dude, the lighting gets so much better. Check that out. Am I just not noticing that? Do I actually have a skin complexion? The white balance. It's the black shirt.
Now look how dark I am. Okay, enough playtime. Um, maybe make my skin look better. Cool. Uh, yeah, Shane Subaru, I tell my customers, the more you tell me, the more info. I tell my customers, the more info you tell me, and the more info that I have, the less it costs you. It's true, man. John, toys are expensive. Can't afford it. Don't have a toy. Uh, let's see. Dude, we're at the end. Not a lot of questions tonight. A, a handful, which is cool because we got two minutes left. I'm cool with that. Wait, maybe I missed a bunch? I did miss a bunch. Oh, I did that little skip thing. Dude. Okay. Don't lose face. I'm still going down. What? See? Clayton said, sorry I'm late. <laughs> uh... James Hannon, what position are DN take boots on DCB 750F Supersport? What position are D intake boots on D CB 750 Supersport? They face like like this. Wait. Yeah. It's best I can describe it to you. Um, John said rear of the carbs. Uh, Umer, 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 Raza, 92 Nighthawk 750, upgraded to LED lights. Does the rectifier and battery need to be upgraded too? No. Nope. Dude, the Nighthawk has a freaking alternator on it, bro. That thing is a beast. You're good. You're good. You don't need to upgrade none of that stuff. All right, come here. Is that the Pilsner rant? Yes, it was the Pilsner rant. That was fantastic. <laughs> we need more of that. <laughs> I'm I'm really glad you enjoyed it. Uh, Alec Kyle stripped the ceiling bolt on the bottom of my front fork. What do I do? Uh, bro, you're not in a good situation. <laughs> so there's a number of things you can try. Um, you can try Torx bit, right? This, the bolts are already jacked up. Okay, it's recessed. That was my timer, but. We got a couple more. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't have much more. If you guys don't mind, I don't mind. As always, I always go over time. Um, like it's like a big deal. The fork. Um, Torx bit, the bolts recessed down inside of a hole, likely it's like maybe an inch or two. So you can still get a Torx bit in there maybe. Really try to slam that Torx bit in there. Um, excuse me. Use an impact driver. Use it manual with a hammer. Whammo. On the impact driver. Whammo. Okay. Make sure you make that noise when you're doing it. Works every time. Um, you can drill. If you can find a long. Man. That's a sticky situation bro. Such a bummer. But heat is likely going to be your best friend. And. Uh, the next thing you will do. If all else fails. Right. You need to get a drill bit because if you can pull this, the bolt out of the other fork that you're dealing with, you'll see it, right? You'll have a visual, okay, this the head is this big and the body of it's this big and it's the head of it's this round in diameter. You're going to match a drill bit to that size of the head and you're going to drill that thing out, okay? You're going to work at it 
um, all the way until the little head pops off. Okay, the head's gonna pop off. Now, the thing is, and when you do that, it's likely attached to inner parts of the front suspension, which means that make sure that you have something to brace what's going on inside of the bike or inside of the fork, okay? Because it's, it's, it's likely holding on to stuff. Okay, so just be mindful of that. Drill the bolt out or actually I would take the top off the fork, get everything out of there, spring, suspension fluid, the piston, all that stuff, and your bolt's going to be attached to whatever else is inside of there. Then it's not under pressure. Um, and then drill it out. Then once you do that, the piece that's inside will likely fall out of the tube. And then you can take the, the bolt body out. Yeah, that's what I would do. Good luck. Um, Uh, 500 Monkey says Z1000SX ABS front brake pulses at low speed pressure, but fine when hard braking. I would go through the proper bleeding procedure for your ABS system because um, there is a very strategic way to bleed ABS systems, and it's likely that that was messed up at some point, or there's just some air in the system. But the ABS system is trying to counteract possibly an air bubble in the system somewhere that you may not feel, but is there. So just go through the proper procedure and see if that doesn't solve the problem. Uh, 2JSIMS. Yeah, bike eats batteries. Latest was new in January, dead in July. January, February, July, three months, dead, gone. Shop says stator and regular rectifier, perfect. Ideas, 1984 Honda Sabre. VF 700S. Thanks, bro. Should I give character to all the comments? I think that'd be a little bit kind of entertaining. Entertaining for me. I guess that's all that matters. Uh, yeah, so... Um, Something's obviously not fine. So what I would do, if I were you, I would put a digital meter. Okay, you can buy them. They're maybe like 20 bucks, 25 bucks for a nice one from like Rosso or something like that. A uh, digital meter. And uh, you can just Velcro that stupid thing right to your tank, right? Or, um, you know, on the inside of your helmet. I don't care where you put it. Actually, no, don't put it on the inside of your helmet. Put it on the bike. It's where you can see it while you're riding, right? And then attach that directly to the battery. Positive to positive, negative to negative, straight to the battery. Um, that's going to give you battery voltage. It's going to tell you exactly what your battery is at. And then you're going to watch that as you ride. Okay. It's literally like as if you strapped a voltmeter to your um, bike. Right. Uh, double check to make sure, like, take a meter and see what your battery voltage is at. Positive and negative. Okay, cool. 12.8. Awesome. Perfect. Perfect. Then put the digital meter up onto it. It's going to be like 12.5. Take that back off. Double check your, your with your meter leads on your meter. 12.8. Okay, cool. So that meter is going to be like, what, 0.3 volts off? Keep that in mind. But, yeah, just take a digital aftermarket meter, put it on there, monitor it, see what's going on. Something's not being charged or you're leaving the key on every time you get off the bike, which you're likely not doing, obviously. Um can also it also help you verify like if your battery is good, right? But the stators, I mean the starter sucks. Starter junk. It's wearing out. It's dragging big time. And when you go to hit that starter, it just sucks like all of the voltage from the battery. The, the battery like drops to two volts, and then it takes comes back to life again. Um, not saying that's gonna kill your battery every time, but if your bike is hard to start and you spend ten minutes a day trying to get your bike started. Well, then there's your problem. But yeah, meter to the bike. That will tell you if it's charging. If it's not charging, how much is it charging at? Is it being overcharged at certain RPMs? Write it. Record the numbers. And uh, pop back up in the next live stream.
Ken Reed, Cody, 98 Valkyrie, clean carbs, runs like a top. Problem now is that I can idle and fan kicks on like it's supposed to, but while riding, overheat light comes on and fan is not. Any suggestions? I can idle and the fan kicks on like it's supposed to, but while riding, overheat light comes on and the fan is not. Hmm. I imagine you're pretty positive that your fan's not coming on while you're riding. I hope so. Why the overheat light's coming on, I don't know. Um. I would check coolant levels. I'd also make sure that it is the overheating light and not the oil temperature light. Maybe I, I had to look. I can't remember. Those do have those do have an overheat light. I would check how much coolant is in there. So if it's on the side stand, and let's say the switch that reads temperature, usually it's on the head. It's like it's like reading off the jacket of the head. Dude, that's a that's a that's a tough one, man. I'd have to verify. Like, unfortunately, I'd I'd have to verify that the fan's definitely not coming on. Even though I, I'm I'm not calling you a liar, it's just like that doesn't something's not right, obviously. Or there's very poor circulation. How, It's got to be something with the fan switch or the coolant temperature switch. I mean, that's just way too odd for it to work totally fine at idle, but as soon as now you're riding, now it overheats and the fan's like, nope, I'm not going to come on. Why would I come on? I even know I was doing it before. So something's triggering the light, either a bad switch on the fan sensor or a bad switch on the coolant temperature sensor. Those are the first two things I would go after. Yeah. That's a tough one. That made me think. <sighs> Simon Duncombe. Could an old gas filter cause fuel starvation by creating an airlock in the pipes from the gravity-fed petcock valve system? Maybe? I don't know. I feel like it'd be easier just to replace the fuel the fuel filter instead of asking that question. Sure, I mean, sure, I guess. Airlock on the pipe from a gravity-fed petcock. So you have gravity-fed on the fuel filter and the, because the starvation from the fuel filter being dirty, it's creating an airlock in the Pipes, the fuel hoses, pipes. Ah, dude. Maybe I don't know. It's an odd question. Replace the fuel filter. Um. Yeah, dude, my my brain hurts from reading that. Any hints on someone doing their first fork seals on a ninety-five? I have a video on replacing telescopic front fork seals. Check it out. I help out. It's 155 an hour at Pinnacle Motorsports in Bessemer, Alabama. That's a little bit high on the high side, I think. That's dude, that's pretty high. That's the highest I've ever heard. $155 an hour. Dude, they must be wrapping that bike in gold once they're done. 
They better be washing it too. Uh, 09 VFR 800. Can you just push back the pistons from changing pads? Or is it different from because analog combined braking? Thanks. Dude, you should buy a manual. I don't want to give that answer to you. You should buy a manual because when it comes to anti lock brakes, ABS systems, it's important how that system is done. So you should spend your money, like 50 bucks, and buy a VFR 800 Honda manual, and then you'll know for a fact you, that you do it right. Don't be messing with ABS brakes like that, dude, especially when it, when it comes to um, how that system works. Um, because if you mess it up, then you could lose your braking in a situation that you don't want to be in. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to recommend anything for you with that. Um, you're going to push the pistons back in eventually, but there's going to be a procedure for you to follow. Um, Los Angeles, $120 per hour is typical for dealerships. That sounds pretty close to what we have here. Uh, Graham Tire and Lincoln, New England will rip you off. They are thieves. They use used parts when they say they will install new top of the line. And they can't even use a torque wrench. I had to replace lugs. Dang it. Sorry, man. I've been banged over too, man. I've, I've totally, I, I have my stories with, with auto dealerships. Never a motorcycle place because I've never taken my motorcycle into a, a place. Um, but I trust me when I have tell you I have seen and heard from every type of customer there is. So I know their pain. I know your pain. I can see it on people's faces. I can see it in the way that they talk to me. I can see it in the way that they respond positively to, to, towards me. It's sad. Unfortunately, we are treated very well at Honda Norfolk by our customers. They bring us food, pizza, they drop, they hook us up. Man, we get so many cookies in Christmas, it's crazy. They just, they, they have a trust, we have a trust with our customers, and it's nice. Um, people travel long distances to come to our shop. Many come from Kentucky, many come from Georgia and New York to get their bikes worked on by us. And that's really cool. It's really cool. Lots of people come through from going around, you know, doing like an iron butt from California all, all the way back up over to us. They stop by. I'll tell you the truth, man. I, I had a guy come from last thing. Okay, we have five minutes left until we hit an hour and a half. Jesus, do I still have people in here? I do. Wait, I do. So... This guy bought a Rebel 500, CMX Rebel 500. He went from, and I'm, I'm totally tooting my own horn right now. So if you don't like it, uh, bite me. Guy had a CMX Rebel 500, and he went from Chicago or New York, North uh, State above us, I think it was Maryland or something, came through, stopped at our place. We're like, hey, just... Got this bike, need a tune-up, need a 4,000-mile service, something like that, 6,000. I'm going on a trip. I'm going to California or something. Sweet, cool. Or in Washington. He's going somewhere far away. Goes to California. I'm like, dude, you got to let me know where you go. I'd love to see pictures of it. And so he does on Instagram. He hits me up. Um, we got a chance to work on his bike. Gets, gets his bike ready for him to go. Leaves. Ends up going to, like, Cuba, dude. Or, like, Colombia. I mean, going to New Mexico. Taking a boat over to... South America, going up and down the coast. He's sending me pictures. He's you know, on dirt roads, bike rolls over, brakes, pegs off, keeps riding, busts the exhaust, has to get some dude on the side of the road to weld his exhaust back on. Awesome stories. He loved it. Okay, came. Rain's coming. Went back up to South, uh, South America, took his bike on a boat, put it back over into Virginia, came right back to me on his way. He's like, a week before, like, this is why I need, I need all this stuff. Blah, 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 blah. I ordered everything that he asked for. Came in, but I cleared my whole bench for the whole day. We stayed and fixed his bike all the way back up to 100%, and he took off to, to back to uh, 
he moved to where was it? It was in um the first place that I said. Why am I having a brain fart right now? I don't know. Somewhere up north. But he went out of his way, man, twice. Just to have more shop looking at it. Now and, and that meant the world to me for sure for him to come back around. Um like, yo, just fix it up before I go. That was just really cool. And that's the type of place that we that we run. All right. Is my voice cutting out? Sorry, who Hugh. My car, Mike and Mary hanging in. You guys are always hanging in, man. Um So I'll read through these last one. Let's see. Unfortunately, there's not. Uh oh. I think my internet's going kind of bad. The storm's rolling in. Unfortunately, there's not much of a bike scene in South Africa. I bet, dude. I bet. That to find an honest bike mechanic is near to impossible to find. Speaking from experience, that I rather just work on it myself, dude. Simon. I don't blame you, man. I don't blame you. Um, I'm sure you're not alone in that at all. So that's why I enjoy making videos for people so they can get a good idea. And so does everybody else who makes videos for people to help them out, bring value to your life. Um, Caroline D. Haven. Driving down the road, and I let go of the handlebars, and the bike wants to take off to the right. Can and have to lean real word. <laughs> All right, I'm trying. I'm losing my voice, I feel like. Can and have to lean real word to left to keep straight. Help me. I put a new, I I put some new tires on that thing, man, and hold on to the handlebars. <laughs> no, seriously, check out my last video on or the last live stream. I think it was the last one. We actually we actually talked about handlebar wobble and that kind of stuff. Uh, check it out. But uh, I would look at your tires and I would check your tire pressures, try different tire pressures, try the correct tire pressures for the bike. Uh, if you have a chain system, try adjusting the rear. Make sure the rear wheel is straight. You know, um, and uh, buy a manual because I bet in the manual it's going to tell you how to seat the front axle when it comes to replacing the front wheel back onto the bike. I guarantee you that manual will tell you how to seat the front axle when reinstalling that front wheel. Might be worth trying. Uh, Ken Arakawa, first time watching. I love you, man. I love you too, Ken. Hey, what are your thoughts on Honda Nighthawk 7092? I got two of them, David. I think they're great bikes. All the Nighthawks are great bikes. Besides the California model. I don't like the California model. Um, Juan, sorry. We don't know anybody near you who works on old gold wings. You can try putting a Craigslist post up or a Facebook Marketplace post on seeking old going repairs, see if anybody is working out of their house. Um, all right. Sorry. Right. That's it. This is a long one. Uh... I just want to keep answering now. Yeah, the shops in North Virginia, Norfolk. Which, sorry, I'm mumbling. The shops in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, one, I will be live uh, once a month. Okay, once a month. I can't tell you when because I am not that schedule. I refuse to be that schedule. Okay, so once a month I come on live, and it's usually on a Tuesday night. Okay, so there's only like three or four Tuesdays in a month, so you expect one of those Tuesdays I'll be on. But if you really want to know. Join the email mailing list. Go to www.themotorcyclemd.com or add to this video is posted in the description below 
all the links you'll ever need, okay? And join the mailing list. And I always give a heads up sometime throughout the day uh, when I'm going to go live to help people out. Um, Speedy Go, I am so sorry I missed your question. I am so sorry. Let's see what it says. Let's see. I'll scroll all the way back up here. 85 700 shadow. When first starting up and blip the throttle, it will cut out. After it warms up and cruising around 45, I feel a hesitation when the throttle is open in the first 10 to 20%. So it's likely to be carburation. Okay. Um, it's could be that you have, um, you can try adding a little bit of choke and see if that doesn't clear it up or, or a little bit of in, enriched your valve, see if that doesn't clear it up. Okay. Uh, you can try checking to make sure that the air filter is stock. If you're running it too lean, that could be a problem. You could have a, uh, improperly adjusted mixture screw on all the carburetors. Um, you could potentially have a coil problem, but it's not likely. It could also be something to do with the ECU, or it could be that the pilot circuits inside the carbs are a little bit clogged. Um, it could also be a foul plug. Uh, if the plugs are really, really old. If you have older gas that can sometimes do that, it could also be that you have a slight, slight, does that have an accelerator pump? If that has an accelerator pump on the carburetors, I would definitely look into that. I don't think it does, but it might. If it has, I think it does. If it has an accelerator pump, your accelerator pump could be going bad. Um, uh, you can also check the carb sink on it. You can also just, uh, just a quick tune up, try backing all the mixture screws out, maybe a quarter of a turn, okay? See, that doesn't pick the idle up a little bit and then uh, cause it to be a little bit richer when it comes to how it's running at right off the throttle and see that doesn't solve it. I hope that helps you out, dude. I hope that helps you out. Okay, so that's it. I'm done. And I'm going to go to sleep, maybe. I don't know. It's really hot in here. But, guys, thank you so much for checking this video. I hope you found it helpful. I hope that um, we could share some information about, you know, two different sides of the coin when it comes to you confronting your dealership or your service technician. Build a relationship with your local dealership. They will appreciate it. Be friendly. Um, you know, you don't deserve everything. And if you are that type of person who thinks you do, a lot of shops work on the idea that the customer is really not all right all the time. Okay. Especially when it comes to motorcycle dealership. So, we have personalities, we have flaws, we are imperfect, but we do the dan our damnedest to make things right. Hopefully your shop does the same thing. Um, and uh, treat people with respect, man. And I think that you will go a long way when it comes to dealership, especially they, if, you have a, if they see your face often, they see you in there all the time and you're picking up oil, you're just coming and say, hey, what's up? Hey, what new bikes you got coming out? Just be friendly with them. Um, and um, maybe ask to see the service departments and the service guys can get an idea of who you are. Uh, and that will go a long way. If you build a relationship with your dealership, they will, it's the coolest thing that you could do because I don't think in any time soon um, or any time too far off that dealerships will last much longer simply because uh, the online industry. So support local. Um, and we will appreciate it. I know we, uh, our shop does a lot. So <sighs> thank you guys for hanging in here for so long. This is a long one. This is the longest one I've ever done. So thank you for the people who have, who have stuck around this far. Um, uh, if you want to check out the videos, feel free. Again, Cody, I uh, run an uh, Inner Circle membership. Uh, if you want more content, if you want some, if you really want to dive into your bike with some people who know what they're talking about, me, many of the other people inside the group who are willing to help and who love to help, um, and maybe you just want to talk with me and get some uh, help with your bike, or if you need carburetor stuff, I have tons and tons of carburetor videos for you to look at and help you out um, to go through and help solve whatever carburetor issues you may have. Check out the website. All the links will be in the description. And uh, looking forward to talking to you guys again.
uh, yeah, you guys are awesome. Okay, so Cody from Motorcycle MD, I'm from it, bringing you guys quality tips and tricks for your next build or your daily ride. Do I end it like that? I don't ever end it like that. Why am I doing that? That is the nerdiest thing I've ever done. That's the nerdiest.